Hello, hello, hello. This is Mauro Fusa from UNED Voice Lab Live. And today we have the one and only Svante Grandquist. Yay! <laughs> and of course, also Dr. Philippe Alain. Hello, everybody. Glad to be back. And glad to join Svante Grenqvist, my dear friend and very eminent researcher and uh, acoustician and so many things. One of the most brilliant minds I've met, met in my life. Uh, and it's an honor to receive you at the Voice Lab and to have you as a teacher of our online course. Uh, we postponed the registration until the end of December. So those who have not yet registered to our online course, you still have a chance of doing it. Uh, you will see the QR code in in some moments when we show you to, to you. Um, but without, without further ado, let's talk with uh, Svanta. And we are really, really excited to know how you got started to be involved in research uh, on uh, the voice field in the voice area. Well, that's actually a strange business. My in original interest was uh, in, an interest in loudspeakers. And then I started at KTH and it turned out that, well, they had a course in loudspeakers, but they didn't have research in it. But it turned out that that uh, simulating the acoustic systems of the voice is sort of similar to loudspeakers. So that's how I sort of slipped into it. <laughs> so I, I come from the uh, from the technical, um, the interest for the, for the technical simulations and, and stuff. Um, so that's my entry to, to the voice field. Wow, so loudspeakers are similar to the voice. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Well, a loudspeaker is, is, is a, an acoustic system. I mean, you have a mass there in the cone and you have a cavity behind it and you have cavities here in the vocal tract and you have masses in the vocal folds and, and so on. And air, stre air streams going back and forth and so on. So, so it's, um, um, it's uh, similar, actually, uh, in, many, in many aspects. Wow, we we just bought the loud loudspeakers for the lab, and we were fascinating, fascinated when we put very loud the music. The the it vibrated the membrane yeah. that it has outside. So it was yeah. like, wow, we can have do a rave party on our lab now. <laughs> Yeah. And what about mother synthesizer? I mean, it is a brilliant, brilliant voice synthesizer and helps us to understand so many things about the voice. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more about how uh, did you develop it? Well, that actually started out with uh, trying to educate myself. Uh, uh, I, my, my way of learning things is doing things. Uh, so I, I, I mean, in order to understand the, the synthesis of things, you, the best thing to do it is the best way to do it is to write a program that does it. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so mother came actually about as as a way of teaching myself and, and getting a feel for for what happens when when you change parameters and so on. And and the nice thing about writing programs yourself is that you. You decide yourself what what knobs and buttons should be there. Uh, if you use other people's programs, you, you don't get to, to do that. Uh, but but no, I, so so your background also involving a, a programming, or that is a kind of a, a self taught uh, skill. Uh, yeah, it's part of my my education. I, I mean, I'm an electrical engineer, and we had programming or that I mean this is um, early mid uh, actually late 80s uh, so things have happened since then but but uh, it was part of my education and I've, I've been programming throughout uh, uh, my entire career really that, that's my that's my craft you could say <laughs> that, that's yeah. what I what, what I that, those are my tools. Yeah, well, and they're very good tools. I mean, to those who don't know MADA, how would you uh, summarize the software? What would you say that it is and what can it do be done with it? It 
it is uh, most of all it is a, a, um, a simple interface to uh, to simple things with the voice uh, really fundamentals of the voice uh, the fundamental <laughs> one of them being one of them awesome. uh, uh, yeah the fundamental frequency but, but also formants and, and the spectral uh, properties of the voice source uh, and, and the, on top of that then there is our things like vibrato and, and the random flutter in in the uh, fundamental frequency and, and also some some things how the uh, pitch trans it, it, how the pitch transition is between notes and so on and, and that can um, be an eye or possibly ear opener to to uh, people that, that that if you can sort of experiment with that uh, to get to know how how would it sound if uh, if the pitch uh, shifted like like that mm -hmm. would it sound natural no it wouldn't uh, and, and so on so it's not a synthesizer for making um, good and credible synthesis for a music production. It's, a, it's an educational tool, I would say. Yeah, it's great to, to hear talking that you created it for uh, educate yourself and it's yes. an educational tool because yeah. uh, I, I, I'm a, uh, a teacher of singing and I like to use Made uh, during voice pedagogy courses for mm. Uh, many people to show these parameters, but also during private classes and mm. for for the student in front of me to 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 show how he could sound. <laughs> if he some well, of his I, I, ho I hope that's not the goal, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the essentially not. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I know what you mean. I, it, it, there are. As if you can change just, just one parameter, you can sort of uh, recognize that in a real yes. voice. Yes, and, exactly. and uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we can see, for example, the degree of adduction of the vocal folds, for mm -hmm. example, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, but when you created Made, did you thought that, did you think that the, the, this kind of use could be made with it? Um, for a nay, singing nay, class, for nay, example. Nay, uh, that that was not my intent. Actually, my my intention was to to uh, test it for my own purpose. That that was the, <laughs> the yeah, it was. And I I mean, when I look in my folder for programs I have written, I I mean, I think there are. 200 of them or something like that and it's just a few of them that that's <laughs> people start to use start to use uh, and mud is one of them actually that that uh, has been used by a, to me a surprising number of people yes. yeah there is even a book that uses it as a mm -hmm. as a teaching tool for yeah. For uh, educating the ears of uh, uh, singers and teachers of singing, by uh, um, help me, uh, Mauro Guzman, uh, Kenneth yeah. yes. Guzman, yes. yes. Yeah. And um, and the good thing is that for free, and you can download it from tolvandata.com. So mm -hmm. that is uh, very very good. Um, and uh, um, mother, you can also uh, from um, extracting results from research about how the voice works, then you can also put those parameters that you extracted and synthesize the voice and, and check it out with your real recordings. So, um, and you were saying, Svante, that is a bit, it doesn't sound like the human voice. So, uh, what are the biggest challenge, challenges of synthesizing a human voice, you think? Well, if you, uh, it, well, it depends on, on the purpose, of course. Uh, if the purpose is learning things about the, the basics, about the formants and so on, I mean, uh, then I think those challenges are <laughs> managed in mother. Uh, but but if your your purpose is to to make a voice that really sounds natural to the extent that you could could uh, um, not differentiate it from from the real voice, then I think that you would really have to um, uh, pay uh, 
pay a lot of attention to the um, uh, how would you say the the the, the, uh, the higher level param parameters of voice? How you shift the fundamental frequency? How you change the formants? How how, how everything changes over time? Uh, I think that um, the gestures in the voice that's really something that that's um, uh, we, we're very sensitive to that when when we listen to to uh, voices. Uh, probably because they, they contain a lot of information about the person speaking. Uh, information that has been good for us uh, in terms of evolution <laughs> to know about the other person. Uh, so uh, the, the control of all of these um, parameters that you can set in mother, how they vary over time and what that those patterns should be that would be the, the uh, really uh, tricky thing to... Uh, so you mean that there are many degrees of freedom that are changing yes. all the time? Yes. So yes. this thing of fine element, is that something that would uh, surpass, uh, the, surpass this challenge, the, the approach to synthesizing the voice with the, um, that technique? Uh, I'm actually um already when i was back at, at speech music and hearing department at kth we had a brilliant researcher who's not with us anymore who was called Johan Diljenkrantz, uh, and he he actually uh, used uh, almost a standard uh, voice synthesizer uh, which had not much more of the um, uh, features and mad it had consonants and so on as well with noise sounds and so on uh, but he spent uh, uh, quite some time just matching everything with a natural red sentence uh, and, and really following everything as it was said in that sentence and he actually ended up with something that sounded almost exactly like the original and that tells me that that the model itself for uh, for, uh, I mean, with the four months and with an oscillator that makes a, simulates the, the uh, to some reasonable extent, the, the, the signal from the vocal folds, that's enough uh, for very much, actually. Uh, all of the other things with, with the finite element, with the source filter interaction and, and whatever, that makes tiny changes to uh, to the uh, to the output, which, which might be important for singing, for example, but maybe not so much for speech synthesis. Uh, I mean, singing is about the fine things, I suppose. Uh, but um, yeah, wonderful. Yes, mm -hmm. no, Made is fantastic, but. Uh... We always want more. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I teach a lot of uh, rock singers, heavy metal mm -hmm. singers. Uh, when what I'd love to to see in Mare is the possibility for adding noise or yeah. some harmonics or, or, yeah, yeah. or things like that. Uh, could we wait for new features for for Mare? <laughs> I think Mare is what Mare is actually, uh, uh, but. Um, Having said that, um, I actually had an interest for subharmonics <laughs> a we long time actually, back. We can create subharmonics in MADE if we change the, the vibrato parameters. We can create a ah, fake subharmonic. Okay, <laughs> so you have really, you have really <laughs> tried. Has already happen. experimented. <laughs> ah, okay. Yes, yes. If we okay. put, for example, the, the, the half of the, 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 the frequency mm -hmm. uh, for the, the the vibrato yeah, you, of the, you, the you, fundamental frequency we mm, change. You, we have you the, could the also harmonic. actually uh, um, reduce the amplitude of every other harmonic as well, and oh. uh, play it one yes. one octave lower. Actually, now, but but I uh, I actually this this is even longer ago than than when I uh, wrote the first version of Mother. I also wrote a similar. Uh, not similar actually, but, but another uh, software called AdSynth, which had subharmonics in it and, and also changes over time with things. 
that is much more tricky to um, uh, to handle, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would, I think, write the user interface differently today. But but uh, uh, it is actually, if if you want it, you you uh, it, it's. Um, sort of available on Tolvan if you want to know where to look uh. as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you could try it. That would be lovely. Okay. Mm. Uh, I was thinking uh, this um, the, the source uh, filter, the non-linear source filter interaction mm. was the model base to create by, I mean, the model explained by Gunnar Fant to of voice production was your base to explore and, and create MAD. My uh, question is that nowadays we talk a lot, uh, we talk about a lot about non-linear source filter interactions. Uh, what is your opinion about that? Do they exist? Uh, uh, is it always uh, exists always in everybody uh how how can it uh, be another or should it be the new model the most accepted model of voice production well every model uh is uh, has uh is the best for its purpose uh and uh, i don't think you should get into the the uh more advanced models before you have tried the the <clears throat> the simple model that that explains most of the voice. I think you should start there, uh, and then, having understood how that model works, then you can probably see some features in the voice that that cannot be ex explained by that model, and those are usually tiny differences. Uh, and but but knowing the uh, and understanding the simple model makes you or make it easier to understand the other model. And that other model might model the voice better, uh, but there's always a balance there between between making the, the model so complex that you don't understand the model. Uh, and and uh, the, the finite element uh, things, that, that's a, a, a typical example of that, I would say. Uh, you can make finite element models that, that mimics the reality very well, uh, and you can uh, build some things that would be hard to build in in reality now i'm thinking about loudspeakers again <laughs> uh, and you can sort of simulate how they would behave but those models don't make you understand really what happens it's when you simplify the model down to things that that you can understand that you also understand the, the mechanics behind it so so models at different levels all have their place uh if if the simple model isn't enough, then you should make a more complicated model. Um, and uh, everything depends on, on the purpose with your work. Uh, do you want to uh, understand it? Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what, you're, what, what questions you're asking, actually? Yeah. I, and, and thinking about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, go on, go on. Yeah, I, I was thinking yeah. about the... Uh, the uh, uh, non-linear linear source filter interaction that, that's a phrase that often comes up uh, and uh, actually I, I have a bit of a problem with that term uh, because it's not really the linearity uh, in, in the interaction that that's the problem it's it's the problem is that the system is changing over time with the open vocal folds, then you have a different acoustic system from when you have, from when you have closed vocal folds. So uh, I would uh, rather focus actually on the time varying uh, coupling between the source and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the filter. Uh, in in the engineering, you have courses in, in linear time invariant systems. And, and those are, are two things that, that uh, makes the, uh, that, that could make <laughs> the simple model fail. That's the linearity and that's the time variance that, that the system varies over time. And I think actually that it's the time varying part that, that's the most uh, important and, and that could, could explain uh, most 
more things with the voice than, than the linearity of the, that interaction. Because does that linearity, sorry Mauro, uh, does that linearity is related or non-linearity related to the reflections of the sound waves in the vocal tract? I mean, uh, the standing waves and how do they hit the, mm. the glottis? Could you explain a bit more about that to our mm. listeners? Well, when, when the vocal folds are closed, and, and then now I'm talking about the time varying system, the time variance. Uh, when the vocal folds are closed, then you have a reflections at the vocal fold level and you have a shorter resonator than when the vocal folds are open. Then the, the wave will propagate down in, in, in the lungs and somehow be reflected down there as well. Uh, and uh, you can actually see that when, when you do uh, inverse filtering of the voice, uh, you can actually see the, the glottal waveform and you can see that during the open phase there is actually no, an oscillation there of air going back and forth and that you can actually explain with uh, with the uh, the linear uh, the standard model uh, just accepting that that the flow that comes out of the vocal folds has a bit of a ripple on it uh, because it, it's uh, the air can can uh, oscillate through the vocal folds when it's open and and uh, uh, oscillate actually with, with the uh, frequencies that comes from the resonator and not from the source. So, so the source is affected by the filter, uh, but it's not due to linearity, it's, it's because of time variance. So inverse filtering is a technique that is okay to perform? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and to put it in uh, easier words, <laughs> you're saying that uh, during the closed phase, the, during the, 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 the vibration of the vocal folds, during the closed phase, you have one uh, vocal tract <laughs> mm. because you have this going mm. uh, forth and back forth, the, 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 the sound waves. But when the vocal folds open, you also add the mm. all the, the, the trachea yeah. and lungs into the system. So it changes because of this mm. uh, opening and closing of the vocal folds, yeah. right? The timing that ha that, that happens. Uh, yes, the time variance. So you, you draw the time variance. Mm. Fantastic, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, but but I mean the, 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 this this source filter interactions are um, second order effects. I mean, the, do the, the, the simple model first uh, and use the simple model as, as long as possible. Um, there is a famous person who said you should simplify everything as much as possible, but not more. <laughs> yes. So So it depends on what purpose you have. Uh, if it's not, if, I mean, if you really need the, the fine details, then you should go to a more complicated model. And if we talk about the nonlinear model, mm -hmm. could we also use the MADE for explaining it? Uh, Is that something I, I, I see <laughs> usually people talking about nonlinear interactivity in using mm -hmm. MADE that is uh, based on uh, linear mm -hmm. theory? To, to show how it happens. Yeah. Um, uh, again, MAD is intended to help understanding. And if it helps you understand the, the effects in, in the uh, linear time invariant uh, case, uh, that means that you will see the deviations from that when you work with real voices, for example, with inverse filtering and see that, okay, so this would never happen in, in the linear model because I know the linear model because I've experimented with it. So in, in that sense, you can use MADE for understanding the nonlinear things as well, even though you can't simulate that in MADE. Actually, uh, MADE uh, does not have a very um, hmm, good uh, uh, flow waveform. I mean, with, when the vocal folds, they open and they close. Uh, you have a, a puff of air coming out 
uh, and then it closes and then the airflow is turned off. Mother uses additive synthesis instead in, in terms of that it has its harmonics. Uh, and those actually don't add up to, to something that looks like the flow waveform between the vocal folds, but it has about the same spectral content. Uh, so uh, trying to inverse, inverse filter the mother signal, uh, you would end up with a sawtooth wave actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. So, so it's it's uh, oriented more uh, towards the, the perception rather than the but, than, than the actual physiology of the vocal folds. But it does really help to understand also the physiology because then you can mm -hmm. just focus in one aspect at mm -hmm. a time and then decompose the sound up to that. Uh, mm -hmm. A level so it's yeah. it's a great tool um but uh, before you carry on mauro i was just wanting okay. to ask something to savanta that came up to my mind now that is uh, um sometimes i get very scared with uh, uh, so m many eminent researchers uh, uh looking so much about modeling the voice and working with hemilarynxes and uh, finite element and all that and um, and then uh, uh, leaving the research of with the living subjects mm -hmm. <laughs> to speech therapists and and teachers of singing and of course we 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 don't have the expertise to do mathematical modelings or the software or at least um, I speak for myself uh, but uh, um, do you what is how do you see the future of research because when I when I look at it I I see maybe it's i'm wrong it's my wrong impression but i see a lot of uh, uh research on modeling and uh, f you know less and less with with living subjects maybe because also we are at the covid area and it's very difficult to record people but how do you see it am i exaggerating maybe a bit i'm a bit dramatic <laughs> but <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, you, you're right these two covid years has been uh crazy and, and uh, a lot of the research that you have been wanting to do with real living subjects that has been cancelled more or less uh, but um, what you, you're pinpointing something there that I think is very interesting and, and that is that voice research is really interdisciplinary and, and I think that that, that that has been one of the, the things that I have uh, appreciated the most uh, within my career, <laughs> uh, with with me being an electrical engineer uh, and uh, actually doing good research with with uh, uh, singing teachers and and uh, logopeds, uh, speech language pathologists, and 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 uh, singers. I mean that that's um, um, that's something that many engineers <laughs> never get to do. Uh, so so I think that that really. Um, uh, it, 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 um, it, it's really good and it, it also um, builds a, a humbleness for the other uh, people's knowledge. I mean, uh, there's not one person in, in interdisciplinary teams that, that, that knows most of everything. You have really have to cooperate in order to, to uh, get a good uh, good research. I'm relieved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I answered your question, but but. Uh, <laughs> well, but I, 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 I um, uh, in, in yes, in part yes, but uh, but I hope that there will be more engineers thinking like you, <laughs> mm. <laughs> that uh, working in interdisciplinarity is is a, a good thing for the field of the voice because it can reflect so many aspects yeah. of a person. So they brought. Yeah. Yeah. And in your opinion, what's the most difficult aspect of, of, of voice production to, to study? I think it's the, uh, the, the enormous variability that, that, uh, that the voice has. Uh, as the engineer, you often dive into uh, the, the details, the fine details of, of the oscillating vocal folds, but it turns out that it doesn't matter that much for at least not for speech 
uh, how this oscillation is. So of course, it is if you do it like this, then it's different. But 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 I mean, uh, it's um, uh, the. Uh, I think that the big things are actually in the gestures that you that you do the, the, the slower things over time that it's not uh, really the oscillating vocal folds and the, um, understanding that and understanding the the enormous variability and the ability of a speaker or singer to do things with the voice so that's uh, that's the, uh, the the big thing I think um for example there has been loads of of uh, uh measurement methods for for voice uh, measuring irregularities in, in the vocal fold oscillation but any person can can fool such a system by by doing something with the voice so you could uh, it, it's very easy to to appear sick uh, if <laughs> if you know what I mean, uh, I like that. Oh, yeah, fine. yeah, that's they really. They, they, this is not a healthy voice, right? So, so I have to have a lot of money from the insurance, right? <laughs> 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 uh, so, so I mean, such things are, uh, um, um, yeah, uh, difficult to uh, to make. So it's how it, yeah. Uh, when when I listen to 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 singers and speakers, and is much more than just how the fundamental varies with intensity, mm -hmm. and uh, and vice versa, and uh, isn't it so? Of, uh, yeah. Of of course that is present there, and and uh, the, the best way of uh, uh, going ahead to the more difficult things is to understand the basics first. If you don't have an understanding of the basics, then you can't go to, to the more complicated things. You can't skip the, the, the easy stuff. Yeah, easy stuff. Um, <laughs> well, you, you, I mean, you can't, uh, you can't learn ma high level mathematics if you don't know the plus and minus addition and subtraction. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So that goes also for the teachers of singing and singers who are being educated. I mean, they can learn much more to vary their voice and how they vary their voice if they understand the basic basics of physiology and acoustics of voice production. Mm, yeah, and that's why our course is so important because it helps mm. us to understand that, mm. isn't it, Mauro? <laughs> yes, come, come. <laughs> come and join us. <laughs> Yes, great news actually that the, the, the registrations are postponed to the end of December. Yes. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Okay. Uh, let's talk a bit about uh, uh, semi occluded vocal tract exercises. <laughs> ah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you have been supervising so many research projects about that. So maybe yeah. you could explain us a bit the rationale of the practice of such exercises from a point of view flow, pressure relationships, and how relationships affect the vibration of the vocal folds. No. No? <laughs> <laughs> nah, uh, the, the, uh... <laughs> I mean, I love in Karolinska, uh, yeah. uh, Svanta, besides being a, a great mind uh, and researcher and all that that I told already, he has a, a he has he has an artistic vein. He's is an artist with photography. He does these incredible photos, and there is one at Karolinska that is from a bubble coming out from a resonant tube inside the water mm -hmm. while we do a resonant tube phonation, you know, therapy. But, but it, 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 it's very beautiful. Uh, very the, the, beautiful. The, the, I mean, the, the bubbles are very beautiful. Uh, and uh, yeah, so and that there are, nah, uh, but the, the reason that, that I uh, started with these, uh, these things, uh, supervising these projects was that uh, I saw a, a research field that had not been uh, I mean, where the the, the basics of the, the physical basics of of this type of phonation with tubes had not been researched, so we didn't know what back pressures that occurred from from straws and so on when when you put air through them and so on. 
Uh, we didn't know what happened when you made these bubbles in the water, what happened with the, with the pressure in the mouth and so on. And, and to my, uh, my opinion, you should know those things before you start trying to explain what happens with the vocal apparatus. Uh, but what we haven't done is actually to, to uh, explain what happens and why uh, this could be beneficial for the voice. I think we're, we're still uh, uh, having uh, theories about it maybe, but, but uh, no conclusion really. Mm -hmm. Mm. But but uh, the uh, the examination of the of the physical system, I think that's the first step that, uh, to do before you try to explain something. One of the most uh, seen explanations is that improves the interaction of the vocal folds and the vocal tract. Does it mm -hmm. make sense? <laughs> I mean, um, one. Um, uh, I, I think that if it, if this is a method that, that helps vocal health, uh, then there has to be some sort of carryover from the exercise to, to the everyday life, because you don't have that straw or tube in the mouth every, all through the day. You have it only a fraction of the day in the mouth. So either it, it, it has some magical... Uh, uh, gives a magical <laughs> injection of endorphins in the vocal <laughs> folds while you do it or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, that, that's not the case. Or, or it actually teaches you something. Uh, and and I, I think that's, uh, that's where one should look for the, the, the carryover effects to, to the, uh, to the uh, everyday uh, use of voice. Um, but that would be a very complicated uh, research design, yeah. wouldn't it? So yes, uh, yes. Uh, but not all questions are easy to to answer. answer yes. <laughs> but but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't post them. Yes, right? yes, right, right, yeah, yeah, definitely. To to be able to track the memory of your your muscular or kinesthetic or uh, memory and how much of the exercise is retained. Mm -hmm. is something that should be looked at definitely mm -hmm. yeah 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 and uh, uh, yeah that, that's why that, that's actually one of the um, uh, um, great things with science that that people are not always um, are clear about it's that that uh, questions need not to be simple to answer and it's not always the simple, yeah, sometimes the answer is complicated. Yeah, and there is yeah. this, uh, you know how it was with the, the slow food uh, movement, uh, when uh, everybody was eating fast food, uh -huh. and then there was a slow food movement mm -hmm. in which the people will take you to the farm and see the vegetables <laughs> growing, planting the veg before you eat them on the table. Mm -hmm. Now there is a kind of a movement, slow science movement. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> instead of uh, you know you know having that pressure of uh, writing a paper and have it published and uh, answer all the an uh, questions that you have very quickly, there is scientists that start to say stop that because there are questions that really required time to answer them okay. and we cannot be exposed to that pressure of writing papers like we eat you know a carrot mm -hmm. on the table or whatever so um i kind of like that idea mm -hmm. too that uh, there are questions that uh, um, really need uh, uh, yeah. more thought and and uh, complicated experimental designs mm -hmm. uh mauro tell us more things mm -hmm. Yeah, let's change topics. Let's talk about uh, something easier, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> what about microphones? Yeah, <laughs> microphones. Then we're, then we're almost back to the loudspeakers. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. The, the other end of mm -hmm. the loudspeakers. <laughs> okay, uh, I know you, you teach this in our online course at UNED, but uh, to talk it to the audience here in YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, you have... Uh, fantastic paper about microphone calibrations and, and how to, to, to measure voice intensity. Uh, could you uh, exp explain us uh, 
why it's so important to choose, for example, a nominee directional microphone mm -hmm. for studying voice and to calibrate it properly? Mm -hmm. Why First, is it should, so should, important? One, one, Couldn't one should, I use my, yeah. my mobile, for example? <laughs> <laughs> First, I should say that 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 paper that you're referring to, Jan Schwetz, is part of that and very big part of that as well. Yes, uh, yes, even yes. Though, even though uh, I'm part of it too. Uh, nay, the the uh, uh, the the reason to use an omnidirectional condenser microphone. So there are actually two main reasons for that. One is that uh, when we listen to sound, we hear sound pressure. And an omnidirectional measure, microphone measures sound pressure. Uh, in order to make a directional microphone, and that's a, a cardioid microphone, or, or uh, well, that sort of directs to the uh, area of uh, of recording the sound. Uh, in order to do that, you have to measure uh, the movement of the particles as well, the, the uh, velocity of the particles as well. And that actually behaves slightly different from, from the sound pressure. Uh, so if you go close to a sound source, you will have more bass. And many people might have heard that when, we, when you put a directional microphone close to the mouth, it gets very muffled. Yeah, I have one yeah. here. I could say, ah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the problem with that demonstration, that, that's very interesting that you do that. <laughs> the, the problem with that demonstration is that the sound also gets louder when you do that. So it's a very hard demonstration to do. You sort of had, have to shift the level downwards mm. uh, as you do that in order to, for, for, for this to be heard. And, and, um, uh, so, so that's uh, one thing. So uh, if you're interested in the spectral content of, of the voice, which you often are as a voice researcher, uh, you wouldn't want something where, where the frequency response varies, where that balance is, um, is disturbed. Uh, the other thing that, that makes the omnidirectional condenser microphone so good is that it, it is particularly easy to make. Um, so uh, since the, the, the principle of, of, of making a pressure sensitive microphone, an omnidirectional microphone, uh, is pretty easy. I mean, you have a membrane with a cavity on the back. Uh, that, that's all that it takes uh, and, and some sort of, of uh, some mechanism to uh, transform that motion of the membrane to, to an electric signal. Uh, but that, that's all there is actually in, in a in, in a non-directional condenser microphone. And that uh, simplicity makes the frequency range of such a microphone very uh, large and it makes it very flat. So you don't have, for, for that reason, you, you, don't, uh, you don't get any disturbances in the spectral balance either. There are other microphone uh, principles uh, like the dynamic microphones, but they have sort of a restricted uh, in, inherently a restricted frequency range. And in order to expand that, you have to do all sorts of tricks and then you get little ripples in, in the frequency response and so on. So that it's hard to make a, a dynamic microphone that is good. And that's why they, they don't get as good as, as the Omni condenser microphones. So all we're talking here, it's uh, how to understand voice, how to go for the uh, the causes of the the sound we hear and how we measure it and how we mm -hmm. understand these these things we are we are measuring. Uh, so I wonder how close or how far <laughs> are we uh, <clears throat> to build this what we call now the evidence ba evidence based uh, voice pedagogy or evidence based uh, voice therapy. Are, are we close to, do, to it? Well, I think that's where the interdisciplinarity comes in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm an engineer, I don't know. Filipa, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what's your? Uh, well, uh, I think we are a bit far away still because uh, um, although we are good, doing a good job, but uh, um, it doesn't help the fact that we are so interdisciplinary. I tell you why, because I think that uh, 
uh, then we don't fit the box. And uh, um, when we apply for money to do research, we must fit a box. Mm -hmm. and, um, and therefore the voice box uh, gets in so many boxes that then people don't give the, as much money to voice research as I, in my opinion, they should. Because the voice is like, you know, many years ago, the teeth. Uh, we would only go to the dentist when our teeth was hurting. And then sometimes it was too late and then they had to take care of a cavity or even take out the tooth in the 70s and 80s. At least it was that was what happened in Portugal. <laughs> uh, but um, and with the voice is kind of the same. We only uh, remember that the voice is important when we are hoarse or we lost it because we have a cold or something. And then everybody says, oh, my God, I can't talk. I cannot give my lectures. I cannot give my speech. I cannot present the TV uh, uh, news, uh, whatever. So um, and I, I think um with the, with the amount of support we have uh, had these years past we have done a pretty good job i think uh, but on the other hand as we compare with what has been done in in other parts of uh, for example health uh, research we understand the voice very basically yet as um as for example, it's easier to take an X-ray to the lungs and then we understand exactly where the problem is. We still don't have an X-ray to the voice. We are starting to have bits, but it's parts. MRI, it's a part of it. Inverse filtering is another part of it. Um, so um, I, I wonder whether there will be a day that we have a kind of a and uh, a profile of the voice that we could have a bigger picture of it. Do you think we 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 will? Maybe we will reach that. I, 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 voice I think... maps, uh, voice maps are are in that way, aren't they? You you yeah. you build up the Vox Rex. Uh, uh, am I Rec pronouncing? Vox. Rec Rec <laughs> Rec Rec that is a, a fantastic software to build a voice map. So do you think those kind of um, displays would, uh, we will talk more about voice maps next week with the uh, Stin Ternström, uh, but um, how do you see this? Do you think that uh, voice range profiles are better ways to look at the voice? I definitely think that that, that is a good way of, of looking at the voice because uh, well and and the the voice maps or, or phonetograms that they um, they uh, display the range of the voice I mean the two most most important uh, features possibly about the voice is, I mean if that's the fundamental frequency and that's the loudness uh, the sound pressure level uh, and so it, it draws the, the map of which regions you can can reach or which regions you use when you speak for example and and lots of uh, things uh, actually show up in that, that that are useful and and um but of course that's not the the answer to every uh, disease <laughs> that you can yeah. have uh and, and you have to use your your toolbox for whatever uh purpose you're yeah, because also more and more research are uh, showing that uh, the acoustics of the voice, I mean, the study of the voice through acoustic analysis is just the tip of the iceberg. There, we should look deeper to it, isn't mm. it? So maybe you mentioned that the sound pressure level is really important to the voice as fundamental frequency. Mm. But can we trust the measurements from acoustics or should we go deeper and and uh, look at subglottal pressure, for example, and the vibratory patterns of the vocal folds mm. through high speed imaging and the glottal area and all that stuff. Again, it depends on, on the on the question. Uh, and uh, but but uh, you have to understand your toolbox in order to know which tool to use to answer a question. Uh, so so um, uh, understanding the acoustic tools uh, is is key to that, and um, you asked also if you can trust uh, acoustic measures, uh, and the answer to that is yes, you can, but you have to interpret it. Uh, you have to know 
how to interpret it and, and understand what it actually measures and how that is relevant for your question. Um, and how do we put the perceptual analysis on it? Because in the end, the voice is perceptual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Loudspeakers uh, again. <laughs> loudspeakers again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, loudspeakers have a, a, a comparatively simple task <laughs> compared to, to the, <laughs> the person rating a voice perceptually. Now, I, I think, uh, yes, I, I think absolutely that, that perception is, is in the end what counts. Uh, uh, it has sort of a in, at, at, at least from time to time, a bad reputation that, that is not so consistent between listeners and so on. <laughs> so if you ask one speech language pathologist, so how does it sound and another, then they would say different things. And that turns out, if you do listening tests uh, of uh, voice qualities, for example, that, that uh, is quite often the case. Uh, and my uh, input on that is that we shouldn't expect that we have a language for describing uh, uh, describing sounds. We shouldn't expect that we have adjectives that describe sound, especially not when we go between languages. I mean, what's the word in, in Portuguese for knar? <laughs> which is uh, vocal no. fry in Swedish. <laughs> uh, and, and how do we know that that, that, that translates to the same thing? Uh, in many cases, we, when you uh, define a, a perceptual term, you read about it and try to imagine how that sound sounds. Uh, but in order to get listeners that, that are uh, consistent with, with one another, they have to be trained with the same material mm -hmm in order to establish this internal reference for the sound. Uh, if you do that, then, then you can get listeners to agree with one another. Um, but uh, there is one, uh, I hope I'm not uh, dis <laughs> disrespecting some scientists now, but, but one, one thing is uh, a description of vocal fry that I've read often is like when you pull a stick on a fence it sounds like when you put a stick on a fence. How, how does that translate to, to a voice? Or uh, like a red hot frying pan. What voice sounds like a red hot frying pan? <laughs> I, uh, didn't, I don't know. That, really. that, that, that's things that, that you can find in, in, in books describing different voice qualities. Now, you, of course, today we live to 2021. We should, of course, listen to voices and calibrate our ears from, from real voices, uh, which is um, which is done in, in places, uh, definitely in, in the uh, educational speech language pathologies mm -hmm. in, in Stockholm. Uh, there's great work with this from Jenny Ivarsson in Denmark, uh, where she has uh, published a, a um, and uh, material with recorded sounds. Uh, but then we have the difficulty with different languages again. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, even, more uh, even more difficult if we are not looking at the healthy aspects of voice production, but aesthetic quality of singers, for example. Yes. That even is more complicated. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, because the aesthetics is something that changes over time, over culture, and uh, and it's really, really difficult. And that's why we should complement also perceptual analysis with objective analysis, mm -hmm. so that we can yep. complement each oh. other. It, but but the hearing it's very important. And for example, from a point of view of a teacher of singing. Uh, how can I help students to understand that, for example, the quality of the fundamental frequency, I mean, the amplitude of the fundamental of the source, which is so important, for example, in female voices when they sing lyric classical singing in high notes, so that they don't push, they don't uh, um, adduct, over adduct the vocal folds, but they allow the fundamental to have a big amplitude and have that flow in the voice. Is there anything uh, from a uh, your perspective and your experience, Vanta, that is a software or something that we could 
uh, or even recordings or anything that you can uh, uh, point at as a suggestion to training the hearing because I know that you have a a, a hearing of a lynx. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and you run a course with Klaus and, and you talk a lot about, you know, even in the recordings historically, how they got shot so many frequencies and all that. So what should we do in order to train our students to know the difference between what is good uh, 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 from a physiological point of view that could go also with the aesthetics? Hmm. I, I think that every time you speak about a sound quality you should also play that sound quality that that is uh, that is the only way actually to to learn how something sounds is to listen to it uh, and if you can have that discussion uh, between people then they would start gaining a common language and when you have it first that that's that's a, a, a a demand for having a, a functional communication about things is that you have a common language. Uh, so having that uh, is is uh, key. And uh, I mean, if mud could be part of that, uh, how does it sound when the fundamental is is weak or strong? Uh, and you can illustrate that by just uh, mm -hmm. changing that in in mud. Uh, then 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 that sort of um, then you learn what, what the amplitude of the fundamental sounds like. Uh, and, and that's the way to, to train it, I think. If, I mean, if you want to use an, an acoustic language for describing uh, singing, uh, then, then you should do the acoustics and do the uh, acoustic simulations or something with, with the acoustic signals and listen to it. Uh, and that's true for every aspect, not only acoustic aspects of I think, but but listen to whatever you're talking about. Instead of doing a reading club, we should do a hearing club. <laughs> yeah. And discuss the uh, nice uh, recordings. It sounds really that's something that we should do, Mauro. One of these days, start a hearing club. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, what I love to do is uh, papers with audio samples or video samples mm. or, or whatever. Cool. There are a yeah. few of them, <laughs> but mm. now papers are being published in, in websites, so they yeah. could be there easily. Yeah, we are. I, I've been thinking about that a lot actually recently. That that we are sort of the the, the uh, uh, we are stuck in a format that was set in the. 1600s or something like that uh, the way to get spread around the world was to write an article that had a long travel to to get to another country maybe in best case uh, best case scenario but nowadays we we could publish um, uh, we, we wouldn't need to actually publish texts we could publish uh, videos uh, or whatever uh, I, 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 of course, I think that the scientific article still has has a place, but but it could be. Yeah, but they could uh, incorporate in supplementary material examples, yes. audio examples, and and there are papers already that yeah. Uh, yeah. do it. And also, it and nowadays it would be much easier to to publish uh, big data sets uh, that that wouldn't fit in a twelve page article uh, that should be printed in in, it's in that many copies. Uh, just a few years ago, actually. Okay, okay. I, I'm afraid we are reaching the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Time flies when you're we having could. fun. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's true. <laughs> we could be here forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just uh, show once again our advertisement here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So this is for the online postgrad course, uh, voice and pedagogy and technology of voice and singing that we're having uh, from 10th January to July in 2022. So if you want to register, just check the, the just scan this QR code. Could you put it in show mode? 
isn't it? Oh, no. sorry. Now it is. Yes, yes. now it is. Okay. So we just scan this QR code, go to our web page, which is in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And the like course the also course. runs in these three languages. Yes, yes. So when you go to the website, it will show first in Sp Spanish, but if you scroll it down, you see it uh, in, in the other languages. So come and re register and come to learn with Svante Grandfist, Johann Sundberg, yeah. Brian Gill, Stan Ternstrom, Philippe Alain, and many more. <laughs> yeah, you have done a great job putting that course together. Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I really love it. Uh, me too, and thanks to you <laughs> <laughs> as well. <laughs> no. And also thanks to our next guest for next week, that will be Stian Turnstrom. Yes. We apologize to those who were waiting to hear from him last week. We had a little problem that prevented us to do the live, but we now have another date for it. Don't miss it, November 27th. Yes, and yes, uh, Saturday. Yes, it will be a Saturday, not a Sunday. Yes. And uh, and this will be our last before Christmas, but we promise we will continue after that. So hang on with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Svante. Thank you, Filipa. Thank you. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you, Svante. Wish that you we were together in the same room but uh, these technologies also help us to disseminate the knowledge uh, that you have and we really appreciate that you took your sunday to do that with us thanks for being with us vanta big hug to you yeah. hey though see you all guys <laughs>